Hi class, this is Marcella again, and today we're going to be talking about site prep or site preparation. And site prep comes in many forms. Um, we see it impacts the soil. Um, we can see it with the use of herbicides that we'll talk about in a few slides. And we could also see it with mowing or the removal of vegetation either by mowing or with prescribed fire. So site prep comes in many different forms and um, can be at varying intensities. So what is site prep? Um, it's generally um, this method to facilitate the establishment of, desirable, of a desirable stand of trees. So what we're focusing on is removing or reducing competing vegetation. Uh, reduce or remove unwanted trees and logging debris, and prepare the soil. Um, so there's many methods such as chemical or mechanical, um, also prescribed fire. And the real, the big goal, so the main objective of a site prep is to get the area ready for planting and establishing a new stand of trees. So here's an example from Nyland in page 88. So um, you can go to your book and look this up. And it kind of goes through these different, um, what we can do at different stages. And this is just an example. So, um, and we look at this, this is components of an even age silvicultural system. So we have our harvest. And we can use, in this, Example, we're using artificial regeneration either by planting or, or seeding. And we see um, we can do some early tending. Um, so that could be protection. So especially in the Great Lakes, we have high deer numbers. So that can include bud capping, so protecting the buds from deer. Um, it can include release treatments, um, either um, by um, removal of brush or other kind of weeding techniques. Um, or herbicide, it can also include fertilization. And fertilization is something we're going to touch on when we read those southern silvicultural um, case studies. Finally, we move into kind of these later stages um, when we've got larger diameter trees. We can do thinning. Um, and here we can do um, also kind of site prep for the understory. So that can include underburning, herbicide, um, all kinds of different methods. And then finally we have our mature forest and the overstory removal. So, um, and we touched on these things before, clear cutting, shelter wood, or seed tree. So we can see um, site preparation, the use of these um, tools doesn't just happen at this stage, it can also happen um, kind of throughout. So yep, one of the main goals of site prep is to prepare um, the seed bed for um, new, a new stand, but we can also use these tools as a tending operation. So we can tend the stand um, after, um, while it's a pole or a saw timber stage. So we're gonna focus mostly today on um, this, this regeneration aspect. In a future lecture, we're gonna touch on kind of more intermediate treatments. So um, treatments that are, um, that can occur at different times. So today we're gonna to be focusing mostly on this regeneration, so these very young trees. So um, when you're thinking about regeneration, you're always thinking, you always have to consider what's the physical environment. So what is the stand like? And we talked about how that physical environment is going to change based on what type of uh, civil cultural system you're gonna use. So that physical environment after a clear cut is different than after a shelter wood. Um, and understanding how that physical environment is going to change is going to help you identify how to successfully establish a new age class. And based on that information, you then can kind of create a sequence. So the timing um, with what intensity to implement. So this is really um, key information. So it kind of works all together. So remember, we talked about the regeneration triangle. Pause this and write down what the legs are. So now that you've written down what the legs of the triangle are, um, let's see if you got them right. So 
We have viable seed or vegetative propagals. You have the soil and seedbed, and then finally you have the environmental condition. So you have the three legs of the triangle. So site prep, what does it include? It includes removing unwanted vegetation, and that can, as well as slashes, stumps, roots, and stone. Um, so basically removing anything you don't want at your site, at your stand, before you begin um, implementing regeneration methods. It also includes any treatment that modifies existing vegetation or physical site conditions to improve germination, survival, and subsequent growth of desired seedlings. So again, getting back at this big overarching objectives, the goal of site prep is to get regeneration established and it growing. So why is this important? I want you to pause and write down at least one reason why this is important. So, hopefully you've written down at least one reason. Let's look what we've got. So, this, this regeneration time, this, this establishment of a new cohort, it's a critical time. So, it's really critical. You're balancing moisture, temperature, oxygen, and light. And seedlings are, are pretty sensitive um, We think when you think about it. I mean, these, these trees, they have large root systems. They have a lot of foliage. They're more able to tolerate differences in temperature and moisture. They're more able to tolerate extremes. Seedlings are just starting off, so they don't have as much foliage. They don't have as much reserves. They don't have as large of a root system, so they're sensitive. So when we think about different kind of site preparation methods, we're thinking about soil properties um, and the soil conditions. So um, part of site prep, one, one part of site prep is modifying the seedbed conditions or altering the physical environment. And what you're seeing here is um, what, what's called an anchor chain. So um, in some conditions, in some areas, such as on sandy soils that support jack pine, an anchor chain can be used to scarify the soil, to expose that mineral soil. Um, when we're not using um, prescribed fire or other things, we can use something like an anchor chain to really mix up that soil um, and get those seeds exposed to really warm um, temperatures during the summer to break those serotonous cones. So what an anchor chain is, is exactly like it sounds, a chain that has an anchor on it. You drive it, it scarifies, it mixes up the soil. So we can talk about different types and that anchor chain one is a definite, is, an, is a pretty intensive mechanical type of site prep. We also have chemical as well as prescribed fire. So mechanical, the goals, what it's doing is to alter the soil or litter or reduce unwanted vegetation or debris. So we're altering the soil, we're mixing the soil, we're exposing mineral soil. Chemical, um, chemical think herbicide, to kill or deter interfering organisms or to, su or to, suppl to supplement, supplement plaster. So some change in um, some addition <laughs> with chemicals. And then prescribed fire, so fire is a natural aspect of many different forest systems. Prescribed fire is us using it when we're actually timing it. So to kill interfering vegetation or to reduce organic debris. So considerations. Um, so the machinery and equipment available is especially important if you're thinking about doing mechanical site prep. What do you have? What can you use? What will your site permit? Also want to understand the reproductive method. So what works? Again, this is getting back to your sylvic. So what do you know about this tree? Finally, you have to think about the residual trees. So what's there? How, what do you have to work about? work around, and then finally your physical environment. And that especially includes the soils. So your soils are going to be one of the key parts when we're thinking about site prep. And so this is really key because your soils are your foundation for, um, are a very important part of that regeneration triangle. So if you lose 
Um, if you change your soils, if you compact it, if you do something that's not good for um, your seedling, you're not going to be able to regenerate your species. So soils are extremely important. That physical environment is extremely important. So mechanical site prep. Um, so this is the mechanical removal of competing vegetation or interfering debris or disturbance of the soil surface to enhance reforestation. So this is an example out of northern uh, Sweden uh, with harring. So it's a method of scarification and you can see it's kind of digging up these trenches. It's um, exposing mineral soil. Um, yeah, it's it's changing, uh, it's disturbing the soil, and its goal is to enhance reforestation. So this may look not pretty right now, but the goal is to enhance reforestation. So it's done with a scientific underpinning, it's done um, with the silvics and the ecology of that species in mind. So mechanical site prep goals. So loosing the upper soil or breaking up the organic layer. You're removing litter and hummus to expose mineral soil. And you're mixing different soil horizon. Um, and finally, removing competing vegetation or interfering debris. So why would we use mechanical site prep? Why? Um, so pause and write down one reason where we might use this. So as you unpause this, let's see what we're, let's, let's see. So some reasons why we might do this. It allows roots to penetrate and infiltrate. It increases aeration. It speeds up de decomposition. So we're changing the soil, we're shifting it, we're loosening this stuff up. It also reduces competition. So you're removing some of that herbaceous, that shrub layer, you're, you're, you're shifting it, um, you're reducing competition. So this can be intensive, um, and we see different examples that we're gonna get to later, a prescribed fire and also herbicide. But these methods can be fairly intensive, um, and the goal, again, is to establish a new regenerating individuals. And while they do look intensive, um, kind of think back, kind of think in your head. I showed you a picture of a huge blowdown that happened up by the boundary waters. As all those trees blew down, they uprooted stuff. They changed that soil environment. So um, these intensive changes can happen naturally as well. So one example that we can look at is mounding. So mounding is basically um, digging some dirt and putting a mound and planting your tree there. So um, the goal is to have better, um, better success, again, with your seedling and sapling. But this can be done on sites where um, moisture can be a problem, so excessive moisture. So these in those areas, um, the mound may um, have a little more freedom, have maybe um, more mesic instead of uh, <laughs> waterlogged. Uh, we can also talk about chaining. So I showed you an example of ankle, anchor chains before. Um, and here are a few more examples of chains being used. Um, you can see this one is in the state of Minnesota. So we're going to talk about when and where these work best in. Um, but here are a few more examples of what the equipment can look like. So, consideration. This kind of prep work, um, you saw these are big machines. It works well when you have large areas. So, when you have a large area that doesn't have a lot of reserve trees, it's easy to work around. It's easy to use these large machines in. You also don't want very much advanced regeneration. Um, you want it to be, <laughs> these machines are big and powerful, but they can still only do so much. So if this advanced regeneration is not the species you want, um, what have you, it can be hard to use these this equipment. And again, limited reserve trees. These are big, big, powerful machines. And 
Um, you want to protect the operators and you also want to protect your site. It's going to be hard to work around reserved trees and get the kind of scarification you want or need. So transitioning from mechanical to herbicide treatments. So how do herbicides work? And they can work in a few different ways and we have a few different examples of um, kind of how herbicides target it from the pre-emergence um, to post-emergence uh, to post-emerged plants and pre-emerged weeds. So there's a few different ways that herbicides can target it. And I'm not going to go into a lot and a lot of detail of herbicides. Um, if we would, are interested in herbicides, um, there's a whole herbicide license um, workshop and class to get your herbicide license and we can talk, I can direct you to that, it's from the Minnesota DNR. So herbicides work by coming in contact with the plant, being absorbed in sufficient quantities, they move within the plant um, depending on what type of herbicide um, to be, to deactivate it somehow. So to stop growth, to change it, whatever. And they reach toxic levels. So herbicides work um, by being absorbed and reaching toxic levels and stopping plant growth or changing plant growth. Or um, There's a lot of different ways. So, oops. One type of herbicide that should say herbicide, not fertilizer. Um, herbicide can be either um, selective or non-selective. And Garland is one example of a fertilizer which is selective. Um, is an example of an herbicide that is a selective and acts by changing how plants grow, including plant growth regulators. And here's just an example of um, how that's working. And we'll go into a few more details here um, that talk that go through how those plant growth regulators are um, changed. So I'm not going to read them to you. Um, you can pause the slide, read them, and get more details on how um, a selective herbicide works. Another type of herbicide is non-selective. So has anyone used Roundup to kill dandelions? Um, if so, what happens to your grass? So it's not selective, so it, it kills multiple types of things. So why, why would we use herbicide? Um, so pause and write down why we're using herbicides. So as you've unpaused the lecture, hopefully you've thought of at least one, if not multiple reasons why we might use herbicides. Um, so basically, main reason to kill unwanted plants and inhibit their establishment. So again, pause this lecture. I want you to write down at least one advantage and one disadvantage of using an herbicide. So as we've unpaused this, let's look at our list and see what you have. So an herbicide, we can kill a broad array of weed and other interfering plant plants. Um, it, it kills only target species with proper timing, dosage, and formulation. So again, this comes down to timing, dosage, and formulation. So you have to get those right, but then it generally kills only your target species. It does not disturb the soil surface. So again, we had those mechanical site prep. That was very different than um, the impacts of an herbicide. It can also be pretty cost effective. You can use it um, to really narrow in on certain spaces. Maybe you're working with invasives. Maybe there are certain species you want to target. It can really be used to target those species and be pretty cost effective. Uh, some disadvantages, well, it may not work. Uh, you also have to wait a while until these species come in post-harvest. So the Minnesota DNR sometimes waits one to two years after their harvest. They then um, spray with herbicides and then they finally plant. So it's, it's a longer window you're talking about. Um, if you're planting, you haven't cleared the brush or changed the soil surface. So some seeds 
prefer mineral soil. So that comes back to the syllabic. So you have to understand uh, what you're working with. It also might be more attractive to different species. So this may open it up to um, invasives or other early successional species. And you really need to be careful around sensitive areas, so including waterways. Um, but all these, all these considerations have been thought through with our best management practice when we do use herbicides in forestry. So this, this idea of when and where um, foresters are very conservative, and these are considered in our best management practices. So fire is another um, type of site prep we can use. As I said before, it's a natural part of many ecosystems and can also be used as a silvicultural tool for site prep. So different types of fire. It can include a surface fire. So um, you're looking at a ponderosa pine stand. Um, stuff is burning in that kind of upper litter layer and small branches. It moves rapidly and doesn't consume all the organic layer. So it's just basically uh, focusing on killing small diameter trees, shrubs, and forbs, and generally very little damage um, to the established overstory trees and roots. Um, however, if there are high amounts of peat, this can cause smoldering and in increase the intensity and impact. Whereas a crown fire is something very different. Um, kills the majority of vegetation in all layers and consumes much of the organic layer. So this is generally when you see fires on, the te on television, fires out west, what's happening um, in California this summer and this fall. These are crown fires. They are killing almost all the vegetation. So what do fires do? Um, pause the lecture and write down some some aspect, some change that a fire can have. So as we unpause the lecture, what can fires do? They prevent woody vegetation from succeeding in several herbaceous ecosystems. So we see that certain, um, certain plants, certain ecosystems are really adapted to fire. So they have this fire return in our role and that can be a pretty short time. Um, so by using prescriber prescribed fire, we can maintain fire-dependent community types. It can also prevent dense and tall understory vegetation from developing, re recycle nutrients, and induce sproutings. So some considerations when using fire. So fire in the U.S. has a very long and interesting history, and we won't be able to get into this history and its impacts in this class. But um, Fire is 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 a very political asp is a very political part of forestry of silviculture, um, so it can be very destructive. So based on that, there is a very narrow range of weather and fuel conditions where a fire may be used as a management tool. It can escape, and you may need multiple burns to have an impact on vegetation. So um, this is especially true in areas that have had fire excluded. Um, you may have to do some thinning, some brush removal um, before you can even have a fire. So, and once you even get fire into the system, it may need multiple burns to have an impact. May increase soil erosion depending when, where, and how, what happens after your fire. So there is the po possibility to damage or lose some of your residual trees. So fires do can shift. So it can start off as a surface fire and maybe um, an area had more brush or something. And that can cause scorching or, or scorching and death um, to your overstory trees. Also, some mills don't like the damage, the black, the black damage from fire. So, selecting a site preparation method. What are we considering? What do we need to think about? So, write down um, a few things. What are we thinking about when we are choosing a site preparation method? Pause it. So, as we unpause the lecture, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about the basic ecology, the silvics of the site, what we know of the site. So, what type of plant community is present? And 
wanted at the site. So in Minnesota, using your ecological ecological classification system. So is it a fire dependent system? You also have to consider the type abundance distribution of unwanted vegetation and debris. Is your site overrun with buck buckthorn? Is it does it have some invasive species problem? That's going to be very different than um, a different site that just um, maybe has <laughs> maybe just was harvested. So you have to really consider what's going on. So your physical environment, what's your slope, what's your aspect, what may happen if you do, if you use a mechanical site prep? Are you in danger of getting erosion? Are you in danger of getting compaction? The intensity and kinds of subsequent management activities plan. You're not going to use these very intensive uh, mechanical and herbicide treatments if you just want to maybe, if you're managing your forest for aesthetics or um, other aspects. These very intensive treatments are generally used um, because uh, for production forestry. They're used because they cost money and they, they bring a bigger bang for your buck. So with that being said, it has to be cost effective. It has to make sense financially for you to implement um, these kind of treatments. So um, here's kind of a chart, and this is something really good um, to print out. Um, we'll probably cover this in class one day, we'll go over this. Um, how the different methods of site preparation influence woody material, so we can see mechanical, we're changing that woody material, we're reducing that woody material with fire or some combination, we're reducing that. Chemical, remember, we're not changing that woody material, we're just, it's still on the site. All of these methods control interfering plants. They do it in different ways, but they all control interfering plants. Prepare the seed bed. So when we talk about prepare the seed bed, we're talking about maybe mixing up the soil, exposing mineral soil, so changing that seed bed. And again, chemical does not change that seed bed. It does not um, prepare the seed bed. It also, in the next one, does not modify uh, soil conditions. And then finally, the last one, that alter microtopography. Our mechanical system changes um, the site a lot. It changes that microtopography. It maybe creates pits and mounds. It um, creates furrows. So it's changing that microtopography. Um, so again, this is something very good to look at. Print out the slide. Kind of think about this, and we'll talk about this more in class. Uh, finally, to kind of sum this up, we can have passive site prep. And that may just be there's good natural regeneration and survival of your target species. And basically, you're, you're safeguarding. You're trying to prevent invasion or erosion. Um, it may also be from just the harvest. So by harvesting, you're, you're moving equipment around. You're moving trees around. Um, you may just get some passive things. So you may not need to uh, bring out um, the heavy equipment, this, this kind of... Uh, subsequent or kind of uh, site prep that you get from the harvest may be more than enough for what you're looking for. Um, so that could be on skid trails, it can be depending on how they remove the logs, if they're dragging them. Um, so there can be kind of this, I guess, uh, added bonus of site prep happening while you're harvesting. Uh, so with that, that's the end of the site preparation lecture. And I'll see you in class.